Hi everyone. Welcome to the Special Omics Seminar Series 6. And uh, we are excited to continue the, this platform and forum to extend Special Omics discussions. And today we are very excited to have a new emerging player in this game, Resolve Biosciences. And uh, uh, from Resolve, today we have Dr. Nashiket Kashikar. And just briefly, Dr. Kashikar received his PhD from University of Cologne in Germany in biochemistry and biophysics. Then he did uh, a couple postdoctoral fellowships at the Max Planck and Bonn, Germany. Then uh, he was a Mercury Fellow at the University of uh, Sussex. After that, he uh, moved to, I think, industry, for, worked for uh, Janssen Pharmaceuticals. Uh, off from the Johnsons and Johnsons uh, for about four years. Then he moved to uh, Cargan uh, and worked there for about a year before I think starting his uh, journey at the new company as the head of business development service and commercial operations. And uh, uh, without then further ado, we'd like to turn over to Dr. Kashikar. Thank you, Amit. <clears throat> so, and first of all, uh... Thanks both Rong and um, Amit for organizing this fantastic series. So I've been following this series uh, for the last, let's say all the five uh, series that you had and it's great to be part of the six series and to be the first one actually. So uh, thanks also for the introduction Amit. And uh, so it is exciting to be part of a startup that is trying to develop something new. And uh, just to give you like an idea to the audience where we are. So we are based in Germany uh, near Dusseldorf. Uh, having said that, we also have a site now in San Jose, so we are uh, in both continents essentially. Uh, the technology is called molecular cartography and kind of. <laughs> so yeah, um, so the technology is called molecular cartography, and just before we started the recording, I explained kind of the rationale behind why we kind of named this as cartography, and it has like reference to the historical cartographers who sort of mapped the world, right? And that required uh, understanding of the Cartesian coordinates, geography and so on. And we want to do essentially exactly the same thing when it comes to tissues or when it comes to biology. And our thesis is that every cell matters essentially, right? So I come from the background of neuroscience and uh, to really understand what each and every cell is doing or each and every synapse is doing. And if you start to average the things out, that's kind of cheating in my opinion. So what we are saying with molecular cartography is like it's a versatile platform and versatile in the sense that I'm going to take uh, tissue plexity as kind of a <clears throat> keyword here. So to really be able to implement the technology technology of, across different species and across different tissue types. So I believe you see sort of GIFs uh, popping up on the screen and they're essentially coming from different organisms. The other thing is sensitivity. So that's something I will show, uh, specificity and importantly also the tissue integrity. So these are some of the key things I would like to highlight. I will not start with the technological introduction per se, but I will show you science as we go through. There'll be a lot of examples coming from different species and so on. Some of the stuff that is close to publication. Uh, what you're seeing at the moment on the screen is zebrafish uh, retina, which is on the top left side. Then there's zebrafish forebrain, hindbrain on the top right side. And Below there is kind of something unconventional, right? So that's a dragon. So everyone loves mouse brain, everyone starts with mouse brain, but I'm going to start with dragon brain. So this is a bit of unconventional. <clears throat> this kind of, let's say, uh, deliberate choice in a sense. Uh, and this is a bit of a rant, right? So this is a personal rant, why this study is important. So we are doing it in cooperation with Professor Gilles Laurent from Max Planck Institute of Brain Research in Frankfurt. <clears throat> so just to sort of, provoke uh, the question, why would you like to even study something like dragon? So Pogonavitis is a best kind of a scientific name. So the rational here is like understanding the normal functions and pathologies of the human brain. So it requires good understanding of its genetic and molecular makeup, uh, of the rules guiding the development and properties of its cellular components and emerging properties of the circuits they form. So in essentially a comparative study, for comparative and evolutionary perspective uh, has proven essential 
with critical knowledge origin, originating from the study of invertebrates and non-mammalian vertebrates, right? And I mean, just to give examples. So the discovery of ionic currents underlying action potential was made in squid giant axon. The first characterization of ion channels was made in frog neuromuscular junction and so on. So I can give you so many different examples in that context. <clears throat> now specifically, so the discovery of circuit modulation, remodeling was made in molluscan crustacean neural circuits. That's another example. So the evolutionary nature of biological systems is such that they build on what already existed and that they sometimes converge on similar solutions after eons of parallel evolution. So that evolutionary context becomes quite important. Amniot vertebrates, for example, mammals, reptiles, and birds originate from a common ancestor about 320 million years ago. In all amniotes, the developing dorsal telencephalon or pallium is patterned by the same signaling molecules and is subdivided in homologous embryonic regions. Uh, in adult amniote brains, however, the structures that arise from these uh, homologous pallial regions have different morphologies and connectivity. So for example, we know that neocortex or the uh, six layer neocortex exists only in mammals. And I will show that example when you go to mouse brain, the more conventional stuff to prove some of the points when it comes to sensitivity and specificity. Uh, but the point is that the six layer neocortex exists only in mammals and then the DVR or let's say the dorsal ventricular ridge is found only in birds and reptiles. The hippocampus may be the most conserved pallial region, but even there it is certain whether all the subfields known in mammals, for example, dented gyrus exist in non-mammals. So now what is shared by and what is different across mammals, birds and non-avian species uh, is very important to identify general versus order specific traits. So diversifying our model systems indeed leads to serendipitous discoveries, right? And I can again give multiple examples, for example, GFP, right? Uh, or Chandler Robson for that matter, CRISPR-Cas9. So these are all results of curiosity-driven research. So this is kind of the rational and I'm just, I spent like a minute on this because there are many people from academic side who review the grants and so on and also from commercial side. So it is important to study things which are, let's say, non-conventional. Uh, and in this specific project, we seek to understand the structure and organization of the vertebrate brain as resulting from the collective expression of set of genes, uh, specifically transcription factors, effector genes that can serve as diagnostic of particular structures, circuits and cells. So what is the overarching goal here specifically? So to, the overarching goal is compare the brain architecture of amniotes at the cell type level. So again, that cellular resolution is quite important to gain insights into brain evolution. The images selected for this, I mean, what you see on the bottom panel, so they are from recent publication from Jill Lawrence group, just to cite the references, and were used to identify the reptilian homologue of the mammalian claustrum. <clears throat> so in which part of the dragon brain are we looking at? So these are coronal sections of the anterior telencephalon, uh, including the claustrum. What you see on the bottom right, sorry, in the bottom panel actually, so these are chromogenic in situ hybridizations uh, done on the such brain sections and those were done in Jill's lab. What you see on the top, so these are molecular cartography images uh, done at Resolve uh, using a panel of 50 genes specifically in this case. Uh, there is slight a caveat and just to be very crystal clear on it, so most of the ISH uh, besides that RB2 image that you see, are more posterior than the molecular cartography section. So that's why, for example, distribution of glutamatergic and GABAergic cells looks slightly different, just to be clear on that. So what, what is the take home message on this slide? So the left panel shows a dot plot with marker genes for neuronal and non-neuronal cell types. The spatial transcriptomic or the molecular cartography image shows uh, the distribution of neurons, SNAP25, neuronal pro neural progenitor cells, SOX4, mature oligodendrocytes and their progenitor SOX10 as well as microglia. Uh, if you focus on the middle panel, so that shows glutamatergic uh, neurons, uh, SLC17A6 and GABAergic SLC32A1. And you can nicely see the correspondence between molecular cartography data and chromogenic ISH data. So that shows again the spatial specificity part when it comes to molecular cartography, even though you are not doing one gene, but you are doing multiple genes uh, at a given point of time. The last panel actually, uh, shows the ISH for ARP2 labeling the reptilian claustrum, uh, which was identified based on transcriptomic as well as connectivity evidence uh, from Jill's paper. And ISH for uh, CPNE4 plus RORB show that the claustrum can be sub subdivided into medial and lateral area. So what I want to show essentially from this slide is even with species which are, let's say, not uh, in mainstream, the molecular technology works perfectly. And that essentially points towards tissue uh, complexity that I started with. 
Now I'm going to jump to something that is more familiar to everyone, right? So this is about mouse brain. And I'm going to use mouse brain as an example to highlight a few points about, again, sensitivity, specificity, uh, how we do data, anal data analysis, what are the features, and so on. So this is a coronal section of a mouse uh, brain. And on the right side, you see the, let's see the map from Allen Brain Atlas, just highlighting different regions, cortex, hippocampus, uh, thalamus, and so on. On the left side, we perform molecular cartography experiments using a panel of 100 genes. Of course, I'm not showing all the 100 genes here. I'm showing only a select few genes <clears throat> because with 100 genes, you are just going to overcrowd the image and you're not going to be able to distinguish. But now we are going to look at only a different set of genes, right? So here, these are 13 chosen genes. <clears throat> and as we said before, like neocortex, it has six different layers, right? And these are genetically um, marked or genetically identified or can be genetically identified. So for example, the red guys that you see right on the left uh, hand of your screen. So calbindin one, for example. So that is expressed in layer two, three and sparsely expressed in layer four, five, six essentially here. The same is for ETV1, PCP4, and so on. So they really show beautiful layer-specific distribution. Now, how does that match with something that is known from the literatures, right? So what is the gold standard? It's ISH, in situ hybridization. So we compared our molecular cartography data with standard ISH data. Uh, so that, that was uh, published about 10 years ago from Chris Ponting's group. So we show here five genes, uh, Cux1, Cux2, and so on. So if you look at, let's say, for example, Cux1, Cux2, we see exactly the same spatial distribution as you would see with uh, just standard ISH. Take an extreme case, CTGF, which is to your uh, right uh, in that panel of five. So it is expressed in a thin layer 6B, right? So that's something that you see in ISH, and we exactly observe the same expression pattern. So what I want to tell here is that, again, as I showed with you with the dragon data, the spatial specificity is quite exquisite when it comes to molecular cartography. How does it correlate with, let's say, the other known methodologies such as bulk RNA-seq? So we compare that. Again, of course, the bulk RNA-seq data comes from a different source. It's from the human protein atlas, but correlation is quite strong. So the take home message from this slide is the specificity and sensitivity of molecular cartography is quite strong. Now we are going to look at cell type specific markers and also see how cell, let's say subtypes can be identified using this technology. So as everyone knows, uh, brain has different types of cells, neurons, astrocytes, uh, microglia, oligodendrocytes and so on. And then there are different types of neurons. Glutamatergic neurons here are <clears throat> highlighted in different shades of red, uh, GABAergic neurons in different shades of yellow, microglia in green, and so on. Now we are going to focus on inhibitory neurons. So that's my favorite cell type when it comes to brain. Uh, again, inhibitory neurons are identified by four different, let's say, genetic markers, right? So these are different subtypes. For example, GAD1 positive, Paravalvulin positive, somatostatin positive, and VIP positive. So what you can beautifully see is that you can distinguish between two cells which are sitting next to each other. So if I just highlight my laser through, with my laser pointer here, for example, here you have somatostatin positive neuron and next to it is sitting a GAD1 positive neuron. And you can see multiple such examples in this image. If you, for example, look at this guy here, somatostatin positive neuron, the yellow guy, so it, you can also see nicely the initial processes, right? Of course, you are not going to see the dendritic arbor and all the axonal uh, uh, Diagonal projections, <clears throat> but at least with the resolution that we have, you start to see these exquisite uh, details when it comes to cell. Important thing is <clears throat> if you start to focus on one single cell, right? So you can really start to see that in its full three-dimensional glory. So why is that? So typically we start with a 10 micron thick section and we take uh, multiple Z uh, slices through that 10 micron thick section. So we have the data available from that entire depth of the tissue. Of course, typically we present that data in two dimensions, but however, if you want to make use of that three dimensional information, it's right there. Specifically in this case, you see all these yellow dots, you can really count. You can really count how many somatostatin molecules are there. And in this specific case, there are 322 molecules of somatostatin in that particular cell, right? So you can really identify the number of molecules for different genes expressed in that cell. What you see also in the center, that's DAPI, uh, that is uh, 
that's going to label the nucleus. And that's something that we typically use for cell segmentation. Again, cell segmentation, as has been discussed also in previous series, it's a big topic. There are multiple different approaches. Uh, DAPI-based segmentation works quite often. Uh, of course, we can talk in detail about different approaches, specific use cases and so on. But at least in this case, we use DAPI as a proxy. <clears throat> and what we did is that we dilated the DAPI signal by, by about eight microns. Uh, and this, it was done using QPath. And what you see are, let's say, the red boundaries as proxy for each and every cell. So essentially what you get is then is the currency for your data, right? Data analysis. So cell to gene matrix and gene to cell matrix. So you can really start to tell how many signals are there per cell, how many genes do you detect per cell and so on. And then typically you start to do uh, clustering, right? So this was done using Serat. Uh, so the data was exported to Serat and the, the clustering was performed in this particular case. So you can nicely see the, the more than 30 different clusters. Those clusters are projected back onto the tissue. So that's what you see in the GIF here, which is uh, playing, which was playing on your right side of the screen. And this is just a different presentation of that data, right? So you have special, spatially uh, segregated different cell types. And for example, oligodendrocyte, you can see different colors and so on. So you start to see also different subtypes in there. Now you can also count the number of cells, right? How many microglia, how many GABAergic neurons, how many glutamatergic neurons are there? So that's the quantification we did. It matches perfectly well with the literature. The important thing, however, is that you get all that information, it's full spatial glory. So I'm going to tell you one more story about neuroscience, um, and it is in the context of Alzheimer's disease, if the slide decides to move, here it is. So the central question we are asking, so this, this was done in collaboration with a big pharmaceutical company. Uh, so the central question we are asking is, how does the gene expression change as a function of distance from the pathology? And in this specific case, it's a pamyloid mouse model, APPPS1 specifically. So we are not looking into tau in this particular case at least. But again, the whole idea is like why only some neurons are prone to pathology and why only some brain regions are prone to pathology and so on. And for that, you need spatial information, right? So that's kind of the entire logic behind doing spatial work. So now let's take a helicopter view. <clears throat> so what you are seeing on the top left side is a wild type mouse cortex and on the bottom left side is a PPPS1 cortex. We have labeled cells in different colors based on their genetic markers, right? So for example, neurons, they're in cyan, oligodendrocytes in red and so on. So just like bird's eye view, you see that there are, there are fewer cyan spots compared to in, in the PPPS1 cortex when compared to wild type cortex, right? Uh, what is also interesting to see, for example, you see these yellow blobs in the PPPS1 cortex, and that is essentially the uh, plaques that we label, right? So these plaques were labeled using a dye called PFDAA, and that was done after performing molecular cartography experiments. So the advantage again is that the tissue remains intact so that you can use the tissue up for additional dye labeling, pathology labeling, immunohistochemistry potentially, and so on. What you see on the right side uh, are differentially expressed, expressed genes. Again, on top right, you have wild type mouse cortex. On the bottom right, you have PPPS1 cortex. What you see that there are many red guys. These are enriched in the wild type cortex. You don't see so many in the PPPS1 cortex. The green guys, they are much more enriched in the PPPS1 cortex compared to the wild type cortex. Now we are going to dive deeper here. So we again compared the data that we generate using molecular cartography with, let's say, a commercial uh, tool that has been used quite often in the labs, for example, RNA scope. Of course, RNA scope, you don't do much multiplexing. It's an amplification based technology, different things. You cannot really quantify and so on. But the whole point is if you just look at the uh, leftmost panels, you see that there is enhanced expression of CST7 and TREM2 around the plaque. So, for example, here and here. We exactly obtained the same result, but now we can quantify. We can really quantify how many CST7 molecules are there in the close vicinity of the plugs as compared to as you move further away from the plugs. And the same story is for uh, TREM2. And just to again clarify, the blobs that you see in yellow, so those are the amyloid plugs. So what we did from the data analysis point of view, we took each plug at the center, and then we drew concentric rings. Uh, of equal size. And there were like about 635 plaques from three different animals. And the data is plotted here. For example, we looked at CST7. So I just need to move this window here. Yep. 
So CST7, for example, at the green line, I just showed you with raw data, it is really enriched in the vicinity of the plaques completely as you move further away from the plaque. The same story is for C1QA, but you see completely opposite behavior for CIT1, TUBB3, and so on. And that's something we had in for 100 genes that we had in, in that panel for different signaling pathways and so on. So if I move to the next slide, so you can again do clustering and, uh, and segmentation and clustering. And we are taking here advantage of that DAPI based uh, clustering again with about 33,000 cells. The uh, far left panel shows UMAP uh, co clustering of wild type and PPS1 cell types with microglia, astrocytes, um, GABAergic neurons, and other cell types uh, differentially clustered. The same plot is also displayed with color coded clusters, highlighting the source of cells from wild type or model mice as shown in the middle panel and uh, indicating the distance of cells at nearest plaque as shown in the far right panel, right? So that's very much bringing the power of spatial analysis to the fore. So because only a few marker genes allow for cell type identification in molecular cartography assay, we could compare the effect of familiar pathology on the relative abundance of different cell types uh, between the two conditions and the precise location of the changes in the occurrence of different cell types. So for instance, we found that there is a substantial loss of neurons. So that's something that you see here. So there is substantial loss of neurons. And on the contrary, there is there are many more microglial cells in the APPPS1 cortex. The spatial analysis also informed us that these changes are primarily in, let's say, 20 to 30 micrometers around the plaques. So, so to say, the sphere of influence of each plaque is about 20 to 30 micrometers. So we would not have been able to get such exquisite detail of information without single cell resolution and the possibility to digital quantification of mRNA molecules. Good. So one last bit on this story. So furthermore, we specially detected the shifts in, my, in the populations of microglia and astrocytes. So in neuroscience, as the name suggests, neurons take the center stage. However, recent evidence suggests that other cell types such as microglia astrocytes may be key contribution to brain function, right? And also consequently in the initiation, initiation and progression of Alzheimer's disease. So for example, we found that there are few disease associated microglia in wild type cortex. So for example, if you try to look for bright green spots in wild type cortex on the right hand side of your screen, you don't find. But you see a lot of homeostatic microglia, right? And that entire population switches to disease associated microglia, which is on your left side of the screen, as you see a lot of green clusters there. And these green clusters are essentially surrounding the plaque. A similar shift in spatial distribution was observed in the case of astrocytes and reactive astrocytes. So this was about, let's say, mouse brain. Now we are going to sort of shift gears and talk about human brain samples, essentially. This is again in the context of Alzheimer's disease. Um, so these are post-mortem uh, brain samples obtained from uh, the Dutch brain bank. So these are control versus BRAC6 brain samples. And we just see kind of differentiation. Of course, the question you might ask, hey, brain tissue, human brain tissue, it's uh, like, coming from aged patients, what about autofluorescence and all those things. Uh, so we have all those issues. So we don't get uh, frustrated with uh, the background from life of a scene for that matter. So we know how to deal with that. That does not affect our signal detection, decoding of the signals and such things. So what I mean to say is that I'm not going to make a big story out of it, but the human brain samples, for example, are good with our technology. Again, you can do similar stuff like clustering, uh, compare the uh, clusters, uh, in wild type or let's say uh, non-AD brain tissue uh, versus AD brain tissue as we did, for example, in the, in the case of mouse brain. One thing I would like to talk about is sensitivity and the argument again comes in two different flavors. So one is comparison with in-situ sequencing. I know it's kind of old chemistry and so on, but just to kind of sort of tell you where the technology stands when it comes to sensitivity, right? Because the sensitivity is a big issue when it comes to spatial technologies. There is no clear definition as such. Different people use it differently. So I'm going to kind of give you our perspective of what we mean by sensitivity. I'm, I'm going to show you in the context of human brain tissue by comparing it with ISS data. Uh, uh, and also uh, show sensitivity from internal data that we have in cell culture. <clears throat> so uh, we had, let's say, about 28 common genes in the, the ISS data, which was published, which is open source, and also from the molecular cartography technology. So these are non-disease human brain samples, neuron-rich regions, DAPI-based cell segmentation, and so on, right? 
so again we are looking at similar area and uh, we for example as you can kind of see right just comparing the two images left and right so you see many 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 spots in the right hand side image which is molecular cartography image and again different genes are color coded uh, for different cell types for example good neurons are green astrocytes are in bluish color and so on so what you found is that for example uh, compared to the old iss chemistry in situ sequencing chemistry so we are at least uh, three log orders more sensitive for example mean transit per cell for about 0.15 uh, in the published data and we are about 130 38 and so on now i would like to take the argument of sensitivity further <clears throat> so what we did essentially we took cell cultures and we have also reproduced that data in uh, tissue systems we passed the question if conventional single molecule fish shows you 100 molecules for a given gene in a given cell how many molecules do we see using our molecular cartography technology and here i'm showing example of two different genes apc and ce and pf and these are let's say low expressed genes and high expressed genes what you see is that molecular cartography is as sensitive as as sensitive as conventional single molecule fish so this is kind of sets the limit of the definition for sensitivity, right? Uh, because there is no other gold standard as far as I know, or we know that uh, tells you about, let's say, approximate accurate number of the uh, uh, the number of RNAs that you have in, in, in a cell. We are going to switch gears a little. <clears throat> I know I already see a lot of questions, so I think probably I will run through the slides and then take all the questions. So changing the tracks here, we are looking at mouse liver. Uh, so this is in collaboration with single cell accelerator program uh, at VIB in Belgium. And really special thanks to the labs of Ch Charlotte Scott and Martin Guillemas at uh, VIB Ghent. So we aimed at benchmarking the special expression of 100 genes in mouse liver. Across three different biological replicates, um, the reproducibility is quite strong. Uh, the R and R square is close to one. Also, when we compared molecular cartography data to published RNA-seq data, uh, we observed a very strong correlation with R square of, like, say, of about 0.97. So it cannot get much better. Here, we are focusing on 10 representative genes. As we move away from the blood vessel, these 10 genes display a particular or very peculiar expression pattern. For example, gene, uh, sorry, for example, gene uh, WMF, uh, sorry, uh, VWF, and GATA4 closely line the walls of blood vessels. And uh, while CYP2E1 is a drug metabolizing enzyme, which is exclusively expressed in hepatocytes uh, surrounding the branches of hepatic central vein, with high and low expression of these genes, uh, genes as we move away from the central vein. So that's kind of the gradient that we are talking about. Again, we compared the expression of two genes, uh, CYP. To E1 and GLUL to publish conventional single molecule fish data from Edo Amit's lab. And as I just showed you with the brain data set, we find high spatial specificity in liver uh, as well with molecular cartography. So if you look at the single molecule fish data, which is let's say the bottom panel in on your slide, uh, around the central vein are expressed the two genes. GLUL1 is one cell layer thick and CYP2E1 is 10 to 12 cell layer thick. Molecular cartography with its multiplex approach recapitulates such expression pattern with uh, much superior uh, capabilities towards quantification. <clears throat> Let the slide move. Right. Now, again, taking the same example of liver, uh, what I'm showing you are, let's say, cell type specific markers for the liver. <clears throat> so as a part of the portal trial triad, uh, we see portal vein and bile ductules. Uh, we beautifully capture cholangiocytes and the epithelial cells of the bile duct solely based on the co-localized expression of three genes. So if you look at the bottom left panel, what you can appreciate probably is that abundance of one cell type does not hamper the detection of rarer genes or cell types. So for example, even in the sea of hepatocytes, you observe relative the sparse cells such as Kupfer cells and cells of hematopoietic lineage, for example. So that's something that you see, in, for example, in yellow here and also in the cyan for that matter. <clears throat> so of note, we looked into the subtypes of hepatocytes and clustering showed that different types of hepatocytes are spatially distributed throughout the liver tissue. So there are like say, seven different types here. Uh, in particular, different subtypes around the portal vein 
uh, and the central winds and such a differential spatial expression points towards differential function of different subtypes of uh, hepatocytes. Now, this is something quite satisfying what is what you see on, on your screen. So on the left, you see protein data, right? And again, this is really hard work put in by Martin Gildemus uh, and uh, Charlotte Scott from the Ghent. So they really put in a lot of work to get antibodies work in liver tissue. And what we did is we compared the protein expression to mRNA expression. Now, liver, as you know, is a super repeated structure. So blue are portal veins, light blue ones are cholangiocytes and so on. But you can nicely see if you compare the protein stuff and the mRNA stuff, excuse me. <clears throat> so GLUL1, for example, uh, that is surrounding the central vein, which is a marker for hepatocytes. And we see exactly beautiful uh, correlation when it comes to also mRNA data. So again, proteins and mRNA match, let's say one to one very nicely. Epcam is another example. So these are, let's say the bile ducts surrounding the portal vein. So there is beautiful correlation between protein and mRNA data. And uh, this, is, this is really fascinating from <clears throat> personally very satisfying. <clears throat> what I would like to show here is another example <clears throat> when it comes to comparison of protein and mRNA. Uh, what you can nicely see here is identifying cell-cell pairs. And what I'm showing you from the protein front are two different markers, Desmin and click 4 f So Desmin is a marker for stellate cells and click 4 f is a Kupfer cell marker. And they are essentially sitting next to each other uh, when you look at the protein data. And we exactly find similar neighborness or neighborhood also in the mRNA data. So for example, the green guys, uh, called EC11 and DCN. So these are the stellate cell markers, uh, F F4AT and click 4 f So these are the Kupfer cell markers. So again, there is fantastic correspondence between the protein data and mRNA data. Of course, we are not quantifying here the protein expression and so on. That's something you can nicely do with mRNA. But again, when you talk about spatial specificity and how much you can predict from the mRNA data, so this is quite uh, satisfying. <clears throat> so again, to continue with the theme of, let's say, tissue plexity, I would like to show an example of human breast cancer tissue. Again, I'm not going to make a big scientific story out of it, but uh, what I want to do is to briefly show you uh, how we can use molecular cartography to really dig into tumor microenvironment for better diagnostics, better therapeutics. Uh, to illustrate that approach, uh, we have done it on the human breast tissue obtained from two different patient donors and using a set of genes and you see these genes popping up, popping up in the GIF. We can distinguish different micro environments of the tumor and we can also compare two different tumors obtained from these two different patients. So, and as I alluded to before, right? So when it comes to tumor biology, it is important to have that single cell resolution to fully capture the tumor micro environment. So each tumor is different and each cell in a tumor comes with distinct molecular reporter. And as shown in this example, molecular cartography provides that avenue to investigate the tumor microenvironment in exquisite spatial detail. For example, if you sort of look into this uh, zoomed in picture and study different cell types and subtypes and collocation pattern of different genes. So I would like to show you two more examples when it comes to plexity and then I will tell you how the technology works. I think we, we are still good in time. So this is uh, from mouse heart. Uh, so black part is lumen and also you see cutting artifacts. But what you see are these signals linked to distinct cell types, um, uh, or let's say different cell types of the mouse heart, particularly cardiomyocytes, endothelial cells, fibroblasts, so smooth muscle cells, as you can identify these genetic markers. So you can really get into also the um, heart tissue to uh, identify different subtypes based on their unique gene expression pattern. And this is quite important when it comes to looking into cardiovascular disorders. And we are doing this work in collaboration with Genome Biologics. And uh, if you are going at ASAG, please uh, join the our poster um, on mouse heart story. Again, same stuff. So you can use the DAPI for cell clustering and so on, uh, cell segmentation by mint and also then use that uh, segmentation for further for clustering. <clears throat> so the last, uh, 
let's say story when it comes to uh, tissue plexity and this is the work that we have done together with uh, Dr. Nathalie Yurishyaksi from NTNU in Norway and this is the manuscript that has been almost accepted in cell report so you should see it uh, quite soon. So the central question we asked here was to identify the location of two different ependymal uh, clusters uh, ependymal clusters that were identified by single cell RNA seq data. So, cluster one, progen progenitor one like, cluster two, different from progenitors and expressing, for example, DKKB3. Based on the list of differentially expressed genes between these two ependymal cell clusters, for example, GFAB, DKK3B, IGFP, B2A, and prior literature, we expected that one cluster was located on the brain parenchyma on the midline. And while the other would correspond to cerebrospinal fluid producing organ, the uh, I mean CSA producing organ chloride plexus. Uh, so to this end, we perform molecular cartography uh, on adult telencephalonic cryo section. So that's the, the schematics that you see here. And coronal sections were prepared, and DAPI labeled signal, DAPI labeled images can be seen in the leftmost image on your screen. So if you zoom in, so that's the bottom panel uh, on your left side of the screen, you start to see individual cells uh, labeled with DAPI, both on the midline and choroid plexus. So that is in set one and in set two, respectively. So importantly, the data showed that ependymal cells marked by FOXJ1A. Uh, and or FOXJ1B expressing GFAP, which is astrocytic, known astrocytic marker, were present in the midline. So that's in set one and not in the choroid plexus, so which is in set two, uh, with the ependymal cells expressing IGF DP2A and DKK3B uh, that were enriched in choroid plexus, which is in set two, two actually. Uh, and when you compare that to the midline in set one. So the take home message is that the molecular cartography confirmed the hypothesis that these two ependymal clusters are spatially organized in the brain. So <clears throat> taken together, right? So with molecular cartography, we are really looking to break barriers in the life science research, whether it is neurological disorders, basic neuroscience, but give the example of evolution for that matter, uh, neuroscience, uh, I mean, how the brain evolves, you can also give that arguments for other systems. Importantly, oncology, uh, it's a big unmet need from both basic research point of view and also from the clinical point of view. Developmental biology, uh, whether these are developing uh, animals, for example, mouse embryos, or also this could be, let's say, organoids, right? So I haven't shown you the example of organoids, but if you go to results website, you can download the white paper, which tells you the applicability of molecular, molecular cartography on brain organoids, for that matter. Infectious diseases, SARS-CoV-2. So, the underlying theme for behind all these different biological disciplines is to understand the tissue microenvironment at okay. single cell level, subcellular level, be able to quantify so that you can identify what is similar and what is different uh, in each of those cells. <clears throat> so now a bit about resolve. Uh, and also then on the next slide, how the technology works. So what we are essentially taking pride is differentiation by methodology. So we essentially, I mean, I showed you with the data. So we really have high resolution uh, when it comes to detecting subcellular events happening in a given cell. I showed you that three-dimensional image of the somatostatin positive neuron. Uh, high sensitivity, I again showed you that by example, when we compared it to conventional single molecule fish and also some other methods. Importantly, the tissue remains intact so that you can use it for analysis of um, uh, let's say different pathologies or again, different uh, cell types uh, using antibody stainings and so on. So how does the technology work briefly? So it is based on combinatorial color coding. So it's an imaging based technology. So you typically start with a 10 micron thick tissue section as uh, added to you. So we design gene specific probes. So, um, and there are multiple probes uh, spanning each of those genes, right? And then we color the probes, we image the probes and we decolorize the probes. How that process occurs, that's the proprietary stuff uh, for Resolve. And uh, important thing to know is, again, from the versatility point of view, that we can process multiple samples at a given point of time. And we will come to that on the following slide. <clears throat> so this is the slide that kind of gives you a summary overview of uh, what Resolve essentially offers uh, through its molecular cartography technology. So we do up to 100 genes simultaneously. Uh, in principle, there is no limitation in terms of which genes you can or which you cannot choose. So the panel of 
the panel is customizable. Uh, the resolution that you get is cellular and subcellular. Uh, been, then of course you have it in two dimensions and three dimensions. Of course, typically we present the data in two dimensions, but as I told you before, if you want to have the three dimensional information, it's out there. Of course, we are not doing 50 or 100 micron thick tissue sections as yet, but uh, even in that 10 micron thick tissue, se tissue section, you can capture a lot of information in three dimensions, particularly if you are interested in subcellular localization of transcripts. It's an imaging based technology, so you are going to generate lots and lots of data. However, we don't put that burden onto our customer. So we have a dedicated bioinformatics pipeline that uh, analyzes the primary data on the fly, uh, performs spot segmentation, does error correction, decoding, and all that stuff. And what essentially you get is a essentially it's a text file, right? Uh, in the end, um, our spot coordinates for millions and millions of spots that you see and the identity of those genes. Then to analyze or to visualize that data, we have a dedicated bioinformatics software where you can uh, do clustering, co-localization co analysis and so on. Important is quantification. So one spot corresponds to one transcript. <clears throat> we talked about multiplexing. Uh, in a different context, for example, I mean, as, as I told you, right, so we can combine it with dye labeling, immunohistochemistry, and so on, throughput. So that's the important part. So we process up to, or we can process up to 24 samples in parallel. So how does that work? So we, so it, so those 24 samples are divided into three slides, let's put it this way, and each slide contains eight wells. And in each of those eight wells, you can house one sample. And we can pr process 24 samples like that in parallel. Then on each of those samples, either you have the same set of 100 genes or you can have different set of 100 genes. So in principle, you can probe 2,400 genes in one group. Of course, it's going to come from different sections, but you could have it from the same biological uh, material or let's say from the same uh, animal and so on. Sensitivity, we talked a quite a lot about it. So we do not use any enzymes. Uh, we do not have any amplification. We do not have any laser capture and so on. So by definition, single molecule fish based technology. And again, I showed you with the data that sensitivity is quite comparable with conventional single molecule fish methods. We started with tissue plexicity. Uh, so in terms, when it comes to sample types, we have validated technology across different species. I showed you the example of mouse, human, zebra fish and so on. So that is perfectly fine. Uh, different tissue types, brain, kidney, liver, spleen, and so on. Cell culture, I haven't shown you the data, but cell culture is relatively easy, whether it's our hex cells, neuronal cultures, or HeLa cells, or any other, for example, induced pluripotent iPSCD, right? Let's say microglial cultures and so on. So that's perfectly fine. <clears throat> so just kind of a short, let's say, how does that work, right? I mean, if you want to use the technology, what are you going to do? So we had an oversubscribed early access program uh, that is closed now. So we have launched the commercial service offering. And when we started, I told you that uh, we had two campuses. One is in Monheim uh, in Germany, which is near Dusseldorf and the other facility is in San Jose. So we had launched the commercial service business. So essentially we are launching the online tool to order probes uh, where you can also select your genes and all that stuff. So you get your dedicated, let's say, personalized my result portal where you have access to everything about your project and you also get let's say the timelines of how where your sample is when it is going to be processed and all that stuff and that's where also your data will be sort of uh, delivered you then receive the kit uh, to prepare the samples uh, you mount the samples uh, based on the protocol that we supply you you ship the samples back to us not necessarily by ups you can also use other courier system no bias there the product is data. So essentially what you get is data, right? Uh, together with the software for you to analyze and interpret uh, that stuff. So the take home message is that it's an end to end service. So as a customer, you just need to prepare the sample. Importantly, have a scientific hypothesis first, have the knowledge of which hundred genes you want to uh, look at, or at least have understanding of, let's say, which signaling pathways you want to look at and so on and we take care of everything and then you get the data back. So that's it essentially from me. And again, just kind of a message. So if you have any questions when it comes to having projects and so on, just drop an email to info at resolves-biosciences.com. So I think I'm going to stop here and take 
I already see 12 questions. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Natsuki. Uh, this is a great talk. I so much enjoyed the, the biological story you discussed at the beginning. Uh, I think my question is going to be kind of centered around those very, very interesting data, but uh, lots of technical questions in the chat box. Um, sure. I don't know if you want to read and answer them first. Yes. Okay. So I start with the last one, then I go sort of scroll up. <clears throat> So the question is from Tiju. So he is asking, I'm confused. Is this only a service for researchers or is this an instrument for people to use in their own lab? Great question. So as I alluded, so we have launched a commercial service business across the pond, both in the US and also in Europe. Uh, the instrument is available for sale. So again, if you are interested, again, it's for sales customers. If you're interested, just drop an email to info at resolvebiosciences.com. Let's say info at resolve-biosciences.com and we will get in touch with you. So let me scroll up. So I had another same question from Eric. So I think I answered that. So what data is there to support the digital quantification parameters that one spot is equal to one transit? <clears throat> so great question. So I'm going to give kind of a long winded answer. <clears throat> so we, it's a combinatorial sequencing some combinatorial and fish based technology. So each gene is probed multiple times. <clears throat> there are multiple probes for a given gene to make sure that this signal fidelity is quite strong. Each spot is diffraction limited. Uh, there are internal controls when it comes to making sure that the spot calling is appropriate and also for the decoding. So we have inbuilt error correction methods and so on. Uh, just to give another example, right? Each spot has to be seen in three different layers um, because you have point spread function, right? So if you are going to see it in one plane, so you should see something above and below. So if that's not the case, that's going to be an artifact and so on. The other thing I would say is that the false positive rates that we have with our technology are quite low, almost negligible. So just to give numbers, it's somewhere between 0.05% to 0.1%. So it's quite low when it comes to false positive rates. So the signal the taken together, the argument is that each part that you see corresponds to essentially one transcript. So not more essentially. And that also matches to or goes to the argument of conventional single molecule fish. The other question that Brett Cook has, I guess he's from Rebus. So what is the minimum gene length in that molecular cartography target? So there is no secret. So we like to have genes which are at least 500 nucleotides in length. Uh, scrolling up. So how long does it take to acquire 100 genes? This is a question from Eric. <clears throat> so it is not about how long it takes to acquire 100 genes, whether you're looking at 20 genes, 100 genes, it does not matter. The point is the time it takes for the automated instrument to run because it has imaging and fluidics component in it. But uh, on a, for a typical experiment, it's somewhere between three to four days to perform eight uh, samples essentially uh, with your 100 gene panel. So the other question that I see is to, 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 to Emeka. I would like to echo the other question as it is difficult to assess the value of this technology without knowing what it is actually done. What exactly is molecular, molecular cartography? Hold on, I lost the question. Yeah, I think your last couple of slides kind of yeah. answer quite yeah. a lot of those questions. Yes, I did. Hmm. So there is just one question on FFP. So I can answer that. So we are really working on FFP at the moment and we understand the value of FFP. Of course, we need to be very careful about FFP samples and it has been discussed quite often on this floor for in earlier conversations. Uh, having said that, we are not offering FFP as a product at this stage, but you have specific projects for FFP samples, just give us a shout. So I don't really understand the question from Luciano. Are any scope for 48 targets where exactly it is commercial? Maybe Luciano, you can yeah, let's, speak that out later. So Lou, Lou, if you are available, you can, I think that's related to RNA scope. <laughs> yes. So this is not RNA scope, Luciano, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, I'm so a, yeah, I'm delighted to tell you guys actually um, ACD bio gonna uh, speak as well. And uh, just uh, stay tuned. 
So this is a question from Anushka Dixit. So in some cases with very saturated signal, right? So I mean the images, many of the images that I showed you, Anushka, were kind of you know, zoomed out images. So you see kind of crowding, but you start to zoom in, you really start to see these spots which are separated from each other. I mean, I showed you that from example with the somatostatin neuron. So these spots are really segregated from each other and the resolution is diffraction limited. I answered the question of FP. Yeah, maybe to, uh, Nasuke, maybe to follow the, the same question, so a new question that just uh, came into the chat box, that's uh, to get that resolution, what's not uh, objective and a, well, what's not optics setting you use? So, yeah, so I cannot, so uh, it is 25 subjective. So, I mean, I can say that because it's published in the manuscript in terms of materials and methods, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think that was also the question from Gauro. The last question. Yeah. Buh, 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 buh. Yeah, that's not objective kind of optics. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So there is a question from Raymond. So how does the sensitivity and specificity compare with all the technologies currently available? Current, certainly there are trade-offs with your tech and others. So what are the weaknesses? So that's a good question, right? I mean, it has also been discussed on this platform when it comes to sensitivity. I showed you with data that specificity and sensitivity is quite, quite strong. Uh, how does it comparable with other technologies? So I don't think anybody has done that benchmark in a sense. And of course, depending on the, if the technology is based on sequencing or imaging or let's say fish-based technologies, you have different approaches or look, approaches to look at those questions. So I don't have an answer to that question. I just showed you the comparison with ISS in situ sequencing-based data. And uh, one thing I would like to say is that even if you are doing, for example, something like sequencing in a typical run, you are going to just capture the most abundant transcripts. Uh, so even it is whole transcriptome, it's not really whole transcriptome on most occasions. So what you are going to miss in those cases are, let's say, genes which are expressed rarely. So one of the strengths of molecular cartography is to be really this the ability to detect the rare genes. So where there are only a few copies and you can detect those with confidence because as I mentioned to you, the false positive rates are quite low. So I don't have a direct answer to your question because there are no studies to compare different technologies, of course, that again, there are a lot of things to take into consideration how well the cell segmentation works across different technologies and so on. So some people have, let's say, made the data publicly available, we have looked into it and so on. But as far as I know, there is no direct comparison uh, coming from anywhere. <clears throat> Anything that I've missed? So I think yeah. one, yeah, go ahead, John. Oh, I think my, my colleague, uh, Steve Wan asked uh, the, so how the chemistry actually work that uh, you, you just uh, image different genes one by one, or you just, uh, you do something like a combinatorial bar. So it is a, yeah, so it is a combinatorial approach that as I'm alluded to, is it is not yeah. one by one. So essentially you are looking at all the genes at a given point of, I mean, in each of those rounds, mm -hmm. how that combinatorial approaches works is different to other technologies and that's the proprietary part of result. Yeah. That's great. It's a clarify. <laughs> so, Ahmed? Oh, yeah, actually, I was going to bring up exactly the same thing. So, the mm -hmm. essay might have different, uh, you know, properties, right? But the final result, do you think you guys will achieve maybe better? I mean, we talked about sensitivity, but uh, like what makes you think like that this will be like a really nice approach in the, you know, future, right? Like uh, for our audience, what would you suggest like to take one message in terms of fish approaches, right? Like, <clears throat> What would yeah. be your uh -huh, uniqueness? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, I would like to go back to four different points, right? So mm -hmm. tissue complexity, right? So many of the technologies are limited to which tissues you can process or you cannot process. So mm -hmm. that's kind of the, uh, the, the core point I would like to highlight. The other thing is also the, uh, the fact that the tissue remains intact. So it is not destroyed during the process. So that's why you can do additional immunohistochemistry to label specific cell types, and then you can also use that histochemistry for photo cell segmentation and so on, right? So for example, if you're looking to brain, you can label the GFAP antibodies, then you can, let's say, label the boundaries of your astrocytes, use that information for cell segmentation and all those things. Again, to label the pathologies, I showed you by example and so on. 
The third part is, I told you, is about sensitivity. We go back to that same point quite often, but it's quite important, right? Because nobody has really looked into that so far in detail, right? Because if you are, if you require 30 to 40 markers to classify a cell, so that's going to be poor. So uh, if you can do that with confidence only with three or four markers, that's something we can nicely do. Again, I have shown that by example. So that's one of the key strengths to really be able to use few markers to identify different cell types and cell subtypes. And the other thing is the data analysis part, right? So we understand that the data is, pro is our product. Not everyone has the expertise or capability to, to, let's say, handle the data. So we make the data really accessible to the customer. Um, the software that we deliver, so it's a browser-based interface that's really intuitive. So I haven't showed that I haven't had a chance to show you, but um, or, so there are two versions actually. One is an one is an image J-based plugin, and the other one is a browser-based in interface. But both are really let's say intuitive to the end user so that you can visualize your data in a nice manner. You can perform basic analysis such as clustering. You can also do, let's say, the, uh, sorry, segmentation, clustering. If you want to export the data to, let's say, publicly available uh, tools such as Surat or Geoto, so that's also easily doable. So these are kind of the strengths when it comes to using molecular cartography and why you should molecular cartography. Of course, you can argue that we do only 100 genes only in quotes. So, but the, the, the whole point is even with 100 genes with that sensitivity, you can achieve a lot. So sometimes less is more and more is not good. So if you are getting good quality data with those 100 genes, that's going to help your scientific hypothesis. So that's where you should go for molecular cartography. I see, so it's like more gentle protocol yeah. with more support in the software. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. then the other thing I would like to add is like the ability to use many different samples, right? Because in biology, there is always a question of repetition, right? Biological replicates, technical replicates. And I come from a different scientific background, right? I mean, I don't come from the transcriptomic field or sequencing field, but quite often a lot of studies are not powered enough with uh, replicates and so on. It has probably something to do with cost or whatever that is. But we can process eight samples in parallel on a given slide, and we can process three such slides. So we have 24 samples. So you can have enough biological replicates and technical replicates to have confidence with the, in the data that you have. And that's quite important when you're, for example, working with human samples, right? So there is going to be biological variation, which you cannot avoid, but that's where you need that power. When it comes to, let's say, standard samples like mouse, tissue, and so on, so I showed you that from the technical side, the reproducibility is quite strong, right? But to, let's say, account for biological variability, again, as I said, human samples are those to be organoids. Where there, is inher there are inherent differences, you need to have that uh, strong, strong N, essentially. And that's where also we are quite strong. Thank you. There are a couple of additional questions on the chat. So does eight samples mean eight tissues? So these are eight different tissues, that's right. So each slide is divided into eight wells and in each well, you can place one sample each. So how big is that well? So each well is about a centimeter by centimeter. Uh, we, of course, we do not do a centimeter by centimeter because again, your tissue that you are going to place is not going to be exactly centimeter by centimeter, but mm -hmm. you get a certain tile budget. And uh, if there are, let's say, I mean, whenever there are, let's say, projects coming in, we discuss that tile budget or uh, area budget. You can, let's say, split that area budget across eight wells. So for example, in well A, you want to image larger area compared to a well B and so on. So that's that's flexible in a sense. Mm -hmm. So essentially you what, what you get is a preview scan image where there is a virtual grid. You select which areas you want to image and that's what you get it from the instrument, which is a fully automated instrument for that matter. Mm -hmm. So do you validate all of your probes? So that's an interesting question. So let's get to the definition of validation. <laughs> so 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 we, of course, so from the experimental point of view, we have, as I told you before, right? So we have multiple probes for a given gene. So, and each of those probes need to bind to generate a meaningful signal. So if that does not happen, you're not going to generate any signal. So 
in that context, the fidelity of signal detection is quite strong. And I'll, before that, I'll also give you other arguments. <clears throat> in any experiment, you are going to have, let's say, positive controls and also negative controls. And negative controls can come in various ways, right? For example, you can have scrambled probes or you can have probes from different species and so on to really make sure that the data that you're getting from a given experiment is reliable. And so far, we have not experienced any issues when it comes to probe specificity. And again, I just showed you, we have the data which, let's say, corresponds to protein expression and so on to really show that the specificity is quite strong. So do you provide tissue attachment reagents in the service? Um, yeah, so we provide the protocol to perform, I mean, how to prepare the tissues. And uh, so if there are, so there are different protocols different based on different tissues and we will send you the reagents so that you can fix the tissue in a particular manner manner and uh, so that they can be put on the glass slide if, yeah, if i understand that question properly <clears throat> is there a minimum threshold of how many probes have to be bound for signal detection so i cannot give you the exact number sorry for that anushka <clears throat> how do you position versus more scope so we are different in a sense. So just from technical point of view, we can work with much uh, shorter genes. Uh, genes, again, this is a wrong term, shorter transcripts, that's the accurate term to use. Uh, and come to SFN, we will probably have some data when we show the data for our mouse brain tissue. So what is the cost of an experiment? I would defer that question to our commercial team. Just drop an email to info at resolve-biosciences.com. Wow, so lots of questions uh, <clears throat> indicating huge interest. <laughs> I think Which a is lot not of bad. Group. <clears throat> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks. So finally, I get a chance to ask my biology questions. <laughs> so there is uh, one that I probably missed. So it is not clear to me if you have done protein and RNA detection on the same sample mm -hmm. section and if you have not quantified the proteins. Okay. So by the short, so the data that I showed you uh, was on different samples, uh, the liver data that I showed you, but in principle, yes, you can do protein and RNA detection on the same sample. Of course, there are caveats when it comes to immunohistochemistry, the quality of the antibody, um, if it is monoclonal, polyclonal, if it is validated and so on. I mean, I come from pharma, we used to spend like six months just to validate any antibody. So that antibody stuff, it always comes with a pinch of salt. So uh, you need to have good antibodies. They need to be compatible with our fixation. Uh, and also we will recommend certain antigen retrieval methods depending on how the sample was prepared and so on. So in principle, yes. So we have done protein and RNA on one and the same sample. Does that work equally well across different tissue samples or species? So we are sort of going through that process where we are optimizing different tissue samples. So how it works on brain might be different to how it works on liver. So the short answer is yes. Long answer is it goes, it depends from case to case. The good thing is that we do not use any protk and all that stuff, right? So we are not really destroying the proteins in that in that whole uh, approach. So uh, there is a strong technical possibility to do antibodies afterwards. So there are two messages more. So what is the shortage gene size? As I said before, 500 uh, nucleotides uh, transcripts. When will you publish your technical methods? So as I alluded to before, manuscripts has, have been accepted. So they should be published hopefully by the end of this year and the methods are in there. It is a, if it is a uh, samples which have high gene amplifications, do you have any? <clears throat> right, so I showed you with the data, right? I mean, so two, two answers to this question. So this is a question from College Price. So we, of course, tend to avoid genes which are super highly expressed. For example, if it is albumin, we would tend to avoid such genes. But in general, super high genes do not mask the low expressed genes. So I showed you that again by example in the liver data. So for example, even in the sea of hepatocytes, we could nicely detect uh, cholangiocytes or Kupfer cells. So for genes uh, which are not going to, let's say, to lead to optical crowding, that's not a problem. If it goes, starts to, going to lead to optical crowding, again, we are trying to overcome those limitations as we speak. Uh, it's not a problem. Can I, can I ask a quick follow-up to that? Um, sure. You had, a, you had some really nice breast cancer data. So this is mostly an oncology question. So you, just, you had some really nice breast cancer data that um, showed how molecular photography works in that realm. But 
Um, as you know, some breast cancer subtypes, like you know, HER2 positive or something, can have a lot of amplifications of that of that um, of that RNA transcription protein. So I guess I was thinking about more in the context of like oncology, where it may be something specific to some subtypes or not. And yep. If you guys have seen any issues with that um, with your um, with your platform. Yep. So we have worked with several different tumor samples, including breast tissues and so on. So far, we have not come across this problem. Uh, so that's that's something I would say. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, maybe a good system to to study this question is uh, EGFR amplification, in, like lung cancer. That's also yep. different uh, exon sure. mutations and deletions there as well. So also, I'm very curious about the the C1Q8 data in a. Uh, AD mouse brain yes. because uh, it's a complement, right? C1QA, yes, it's a com complement protein. Yeah, so so what, maybe I missed, what type of cells actually produce that complement? So, so these are disassociated microglia as far as I remember. They're all microglia. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, have you seen any, yeah, I'm, I'm just curious, any other cells also contribute to the Yes, absolutely. So yeah, absolutely. So we are writing up a manuscript with the pharmaceutical company so that we work with. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we are a bit on the con in the confidentiality uh, okay. limitation there. So so you will have to probably wait for the manuscript. Mm -hmm. there. So uh, what I can say is that we have sort of uh, taken such studies further also in the tau mouse models and so on. So uh, yeah, that's something mm -hmm. I can say. Yeah, also in a liver zonation data, right? So I, I think you can further analyze subcellular localization. Of, yes, yes. Because this yes. is a perfect system. The cells are big and also yeah, it's exactly. from a center to the portal vein, right? So you see which transcripts are actually polarized. Yeah, I mean, what I would say is that, I mean, again, I mean, that's totally before, right? So we did it in collaboration with Martin Gulimus from VIB and Charlotte Scott. Mm -hmm. And they have got a manuscript in review and so on. Um, so of course, they have looked into the cellular aspect, but I mean, it's a good point, wrong, right? So you get so much of data, so you can probably have two or three publications just from one data set, right? Mm -hmm. Because you can start to ask different questions and so on. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's again, the power of technology that uh, that is that, that, that affords you. Also, there is a prior, prior literature, I think it was a science paper showing the polarization in the liver, right? Zonation. Yeah. And yes. they looked at translation and how it polarized, right? Yes. Great. So any other questions? So I'm not sure if I see anything in the chat. Oh, okay. I think it's almost 3 to 12, um, considering uh, your valuable time, maybe we can get to the end of it. Uh, yep. So, um, Thank you again, Dr. Kashikar, for this uh, uh, exciting uh, technology and the presentation. And before uh, we conclude today, I'd like to announce that next week we have Dr. George Emmanuel from Visgen presenting the uh, Marscope system. And uh, uh, so we will be also hearing and learning more about the recent developments about Murfish. And thank you again, Dr. Kashikar. And I actually forgot the clapping part. Thank you, Ron, for reminding me. And <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thanks thank for you. listening. Mm -hmm. Clapping finally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, have thank a nice you, nice yep. No problem. Have a nice weekend. Okay. Yeah, have a good evening. It's pretty late <laughs> your time yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.